Okay, great. Um, so first I'd like to uh, thank Vicky for organizing this week's event and the invitation to participate. Uh, my name is Richard Anderson. I'm a lecturer in history at Penn Rin. Uh, and my talk today is on history of the African diaspora in Cornwall and some of our sources for this history. And I also want to highlight along the way some possibilities for future research, whether this is by volunteer students in the Cornwall Maritime Churches Project, or if there are topics that students want to pursue. So much of this research has been intended to lay the foundation for student-led research for students at Penryn who may want to study the history of the African diaspora in relation to where they are living and studying. So in 20 minutes, I'd like to share some documents for people of African descent in the region for 400 and more years uh, and highlight some of the prominent members of the African diaspora who have lived in or visited Cornwall. Generally, we tend to think of black uh, presence in Britain as a post windrush phenomenon, even as historians and public intellectuals have pointed to a black presence in Britain since the time of the Romans. Um, but this raises a methodological question of how do we evaluate the historical presence and size of the African diaspora in Britain and in Cornwall in particular. So some of the main sources we have include church records, baptism, marriage and burials, graves and memorials, newspapers, portraiture, uh, and naval records, including ship muster books. And among these documents, church records can be a key source for two reasons. The first is chronological documentation exists back to the Tudor period and the early history of parish registration. Um, the second reason, of course, is that we're looking at an era when society was much more religious today, then we can look at how African and Africans and people of African descent were looked upon by the church and what they can tell us about racial attitudes of the time. Um, so a lot of the work with church records uh, draws upon Miranda Kaufman's book, Black Tutors. Uh, and in her research, Kaufman draws upon parish registers to explore the black presence in Britain from about 1500 onwards, um, especially in the Tudor period. So Kaufman has identified what may be the earliest known parish records for Africans in Cornwall. I apologize, I have the later transcribed version. Uh, quarantine has meant we can't visit archives at the moment. Um, so these are images of a series of burial and baptism entries in the parish registers of St. Mary's Truro between 1611 and 1623, uh, pertaining to a family of a man described as Emmanuel de Moore. Um, so the parish church of St. Mary um, was, I'm sure many of you know better than I do, located in the current location of Truro Cathedral and is partly preserved within the cathedral. So in the parish register, we have our annual's daughter, Maria, who was buried at St. Mary's in August 1611. There's no baptismal record for Maria suggesting that the family may have recently moved to Truro. Emmanuel's son Richard was baptized in 1612, uh, 11 years before Emmanuel's death in 1623. So these records make no mention of either marriage or profession, though it's likely that Emmanuel was married to the mother of his children. And there's also no reference to service, suggesting that Emmanuel made his own living to support his family. Um, as you maybe see here, the parish registers for St. Mary's were written in Latin, uh, which I'm not an expert in. Uh, but we can see that uh, Emmanuel is described variously. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, it says you're not seeing any slides. Uh, and I have to give me one moment. I apologize for that. Is that better? Okay. There we go. Apologies. Zoom lets you know in very small font that something has gone wrong. Uh, so uh, these are the copies of the uh, parish registers for St. Mary's. Um, and so they variously describe a man who's referred to as uh, Emmanuel the Moor. In Latin, um, but also the fact that um, 
the parish clerk struggled to find the Latin term for moor, and hence he wrote anglis, or uh, which is short for vocat in anglis, called in English the moor. Um, so this was a term that originally in the European context described um, North African Muslims who conquered parts of the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th century. Um, it was also used to describe people from present-day Morocco and Mauritania in North Africa. Um, so within Britain, the term often referred to Black Africans and Muslims in particular. Um, it was often combined with the word Black, such as Blackmore, Blackmore, uh, and so on. So what this term actually means is sort of shifting in this period. Um, so this description of the Moor is actually quite unique within parish registers um, from the period. Um, we can infer little about what it actually means in the geographical sense, whether Emmanuel came from North Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but it is an era where most people who reached Britain from Africa did so via Portugal, Spain, or Italy. So a methodological question of the project is, well, how do people of African descent or born in Africa identify themselves to us through this type of church record? Um, and it's also worthy of mentioning that these records are from the 1610s and 1620s, therefore they predate what historians often refer to as the first British Empire in the Americas, and also before Britain's sustained involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, which really begins from the 1640s on with the growth of the sugar uh, plantations in Barbados, and a few decades later with tobacco in Virginia. So the African diaspora in Cornwall predates Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade uh, in the period after the mid 17th century. And so the history of the African diaspora in Cornwall extends beyond the history of slavery and empire. Um, Cornwall itself was not heavily involved in the transatlantic slave trade. This map and these figures show um, what we know of the scale of the trade in terms of where slave vessels departed from in the Americas uh, based on a database of 35,000 slave voyages. Um, so you can see there's actually only one documented slave departure on a voyage um, from an unidentified region of Africa to Barbados in 1654. Um, and this is dwarf, particularly in the Southwest by the participation of Bristol, where we know that at least 2,000 slave voyages left during the period of the slave trade. And it was for a period, not just the largest port of the slave trade in the Southwest, but in all of Europe in the late 18th century. But even if Cornwall wasn't directly involved in this trade, what we see is that as Britain's empire and transatlantic commerce grew, these different forms of documentation from the 18th century onward of a small but notable African diaspora in Cornwall. And we see Africans and their descendants in a variety of roles, dock workers, craftsmen, laborers, musicians, others were domestic servants and households of elite and mercantile families with connections with Britain's colonies. Some were free, others were bound and indentured servants, and some were enslaved. Um, and in some cases, this, their status was not exactly clear from the documentation. Um, so this document is a newspaper advertisement placed in the Whitehall Evening Post in March 1760. Uh, it's from another large database project at the University of Glasgow that looks at over 800 advertisements for freedom-seeking bound and enslaved people who have escaped from their masters and mistresses. Um, Advertisements such as this were ubiquitous across the Americas, but we're seeing that there was actually large numbers of advertisements within Britain in this era for runaway slaves, apprentices, at times even advertisements for runaway wives. Um, so this is an advertisement for a black man named Punch who was said to have absented from on board the Betsy, which was a ship in Falmouth Harbor and was suspected of making his way to London. So in some ways, there's ads from the Americas that look at the description of the individual, uh, often a perfunctory description of their dress, in this case, dressed as a sailor, um, and where they might have been headed, in this case, London. Um, the ad doesn't 
explicitly say Punch was enslaved. Perhaps we can infer this from his description and his name, although this is an era where various forms of truancy from apprenticeships to stowing away was common and had serious repercussions. Um, so the advertisement also reflects a broader reality in the 18th century, um, which was that seamen of African descent, whether enslaved or free, uh, um, African seamen increasingly manned merchant and naval vessels. Um, while there were comparatively few at the beginning of the century, British captains became increasingly reliant upon black sailors, especially in Africa and the West Indies over the course of the 18th century. And so in this period, the black presence in Cornwall was linked to the region's incorporation into the Atlantic world. And much of the black presence in the Southwest was in this period was related to seafaring. Um, and when we think of Cornwall and the African diaspora, um, the two best known individuals both came to the county as mariners. Um, the first is Alauda Equiano, otherwise known as Gustavus Vassa, who wrote what is perhaps the canonical account of enslavement in the English language, uh, his interesting narrative published in 1789. So Equiano was by his own account born in 1745 among the Igbo people of present day Nigeria, enslaved around the age of 11, reaching Barbados uh, and then Virginia, uh, where he was purchased by a Royal Naval Lieutenant uh, named Michael Pascal. And he accompanied Pascal as a valet around the Atlantic during the Seven Years' War uh, before coming to Britain where he was baptized in London in 1759. Uh, and this is an extract from his account where he arrives in Britain for the first time in Falmouth. Um, he talks about the pavements of the streets. Uh, and it's also uh, the first time in, a, uh, in his life where he sees snow, which at first he thinks of as salt. Um, so Equiano reached Falmouth enslaved, though within a decade he was able to purchase his own freedom. Um, he spent most of his life at sea. So this is a map of basically the itinerary of his life around the Atlantic. So both as a slave and free person, he's crisscrossing the Atlantic. Uh, and this includes a rather ill-fated Arctic expedition um, before he wrote an autobiography in support of the abolitionist cause, which became a bestseller. So his life is in many ways exceptional, and he's only in Cornwall for a brief period of his life. Um, but his life uh, is also reflective of how many people of the African diaspora reach Cornwall by way of seafaring, including black servicemen, both enslaved and free in the service of the Royal Navy. And so the, the naval connections of Cornwall and the African diaspora is reflected if we shift from Equiano to perhaps the most notable member of the African diaspora associated with Cornwall historically, Joseph Antonio Emedy. So Emedy has received considerable attention regionally over the last 15 years, um, perhaps less known beyond Cornwall, but we can see uh, stories of his life in the Falmouth Packet. Cornwall Live and so on. Um, so the painting here is the only known image of Emedy uh, held in the collections of the Royal Cornwall Museum. So the standard account of his life is that he was born in Guinea, West Africa around 1775, sold into slavery as a child or teenager, taken to Brazil by Portuguese traders, brought by his master to Brazil, uh, at some point, he was taught to play the fiddle. He became second violin in a Lisbon opera house. Uh, at this time, he was kidnapped by the crew of HMS Indefatigable, who heard him play in Lisbon. Uh, and he was placed on board uh, a, as a sort of a musician and entertainer for the crew uh, and was confined to the Indefatigable for a period of uh, five years. Uh, during the context of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, he disembarked uh, in the home port of the captain, Falmouth, in 1799. Uh, and for the remainder of his life, he established a musical career, uh, primarily in Falmouth and Truro. Um, 
Um, and so I'm sure MOD might be an individual who's known to you. His life is commemorated in memorials in, uh, in both Truro Cathedral in 2015 and the Church of King Charles the Martyr in Falmouth. Um, and his life is also known to historians and he appears, for example, in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Um, a lot of the writing on him is focused on his musicianship, his musical career in Cornwall. Um, and so his biographer has written a book, uh, Music and Musicians in the Early 19th Century Cornwall. Um, and he's very known in his time for his composition uh, and skill as a composer, um, but also the fact that none of his compositions are known to have survived. Um, what interests me about his life from an Africanist perspective uh, is some of the ambiguities, um, but also the fact that there might be possibly more that we can know about him. Um, first, we have only one second-hand source that mentions his African birth uh, and enslavement. Um, this is an 1855 autobiography from James Silk Buckingham, who was a Cornish-born author and traveler. So uh, he wrote of Emily that the history of this musician is too remarkable to be passed over in silence. He was born in Guinea on the west coast of Africa, sold into slavery to some Portuguese uh, traders, taken by them to the Brazils when quite a boy, and ultimately came to Lisbon with his master. So that description, unfortunately, is largely devoid of detail. Um, for one thing, the term Guinea was used very broadly and unevenly in this period. Um, Really, it's a place that existed mainly in the minds of European cartographers rather than an identifiable location within Africa. Uh, we can see this in some maps from this period where Guinea is sort of applied very broadly as a toponym. Uh, and Alauda Equiano himself noted that this is a name for uh, a span of coast uh, of several thousand miles. So in terms of Emity's birthplace, Quite little we can know. Um, this period in Brazil is similarly opaque. He arrived in a quarter century where over half a million uh, enslaved Africans arrived in Brazil, um, broadly from the Amazon to Rio de Janeiro in the south. Um, so there's perhaps a prospect of knowing more through Brazilian sources, but a lot of what he spent his time doing in Brazil where he resided is very much open to speculation. So there are two other sources that illuminate, but in some ways complicate our understanding of Emily's life. Um, the first is a muster roll of the frigate Indefatigable. That is the ship whose crew kidnapped Emily in Lisbon while they were undertaking repairs in the Vegas estuary. Um, Interestingly, the muster book identifies uh, Emily's birthplace, place of country where born uh, uh, as Lisbon, uh, as you can see in these sources from the British National Archives, um, though the accuracy of 18th century muster books is often questionable. Um, and a final source then is Emily's grave, which is located in Truro's Kenwyn churchyard. Um, the headstone states that he was born in 1775. So this is some five years later than the date that is suggested in the muster books for the indefatigable. Um, and what's interesting about this inscription of the headstone is it gives no indication that he was born in Africa or was of African descent. Um, rather, the inscription states that in bold that he was a native of Portugal even though he'd been enslaved by the Portuguese and spent most of his life as a free man in Cornwall. So Emily's grave raises some fascinating questions about identity and belonging. Uh, and within the context of Cornish Maritime Churches Project, um, this extends to well, what extent can churchyards across Cornwall contain clues for the history of the African diaspora in the county. Um, um, just to end on a note with some considerations of further research. Um, first, thinking about the history of gender and the family. The African diaspora in Cornwall was primarily, but not exclusively, male. 
partly related to the seafaring and the military, um, but both Emedy and Equiano married white British partners. So we can ask questions about family formation. Um, next, how the African diaspora relates to the Cornish diaspora, um, especially in the Americas, whether in the Caribbean or in South America. Also the question of Cornwall, the abolitionist movement, um, and the relationship between the African diaspora and Cornwall in the era of abolition. Uh, and finally, then the contemporary history of Cornwall and the African diaspora. Uh, in 20 minutes, I've kind of looked at the period from about 1611 to 1835. So looking at how we continue this narrative chronologically forward. Um, so I'll leave it there. Lovely, thank you so much, Richard. That was absolutely fascinating, as I'm sure everybody will agree. I think it's really interesting how much you've managed to um, reveal about, especially Emedy's life through the study of church records. And I think this is definitely something that we need to do more of um, in future scholarship. So thank you so much. Um, just whilst I'm waiting for everybody's questions to come through, please do place them in the chat bar below. Um, I'm just, just checking before I start off with a question that I haven't received any throughout the course of your talk. Um, if I could just kick off, um, through the study of, of potential church records in the future, do you think, um, or how far can they reveal um, the individuals in Cornwall were in fact participating in the expansion of trade in Africa? and the West Indies? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And it's how I suppose various forms of documentation intersect. Um, so a very preliminary question is identifying individuals. So I have one source where um, the fact that somebody was born in West Africa or North Africa is quite clear. In other cases, it's far less so. Uh, so if you look at Joseph Emedy's name in particular, his full name, Joseph Antonio Emedy, um, and you look at his headstone described as somebody as a native of Portugal, um, on that evidence alone, there's very little to go off of. And so you have to sort of connect different forms of documentation about their origins and their lives. Um, so it's possible where we can connect parish records, later census records, and then ship musters, however inaccurate that might describe where an individual is born. So really, I think the challenge is bringing together different forms of documentation. In terms of uh, churchyards, um, this is one aspect where um, this project is quite fascinating. Um, I talked to some staff at, at Crescent Curnow, and they were of the opinion that actually, if you look at churchyards, you look at cemeteries across Cornwall, you'll see a much more uh, broader and sustained African presence um, across the county than perhaps we know. So it's a fact of you know, when we can actually getting outside. Um, but it's a question of what information is there, what's relevant, you know? Um, Perhaps it's interesting that churches don't dwell on this aspect, the racial background of its members. Lovely, thank you, Richard. I've just got another uh, question from Linda, who has asked, um, was there only one reference to Emedy as being of African origin? As far as I know, and that's this autobiography of James Buckingham, uh, who was born in, in Flushing, He's something of an adventurer himself, uh, had spent uh, a lot of time in, in various parts of Asia and in Egypt. Uh, he knew Emedy in the first decade of the 19th century. Uh, he undertook music lessons with him in Falmouth. Um, this account's written in 1855. So this is 20 years after Emedy's death. Um, it's of course 20 years after abolition in the British Empire. Um, as far as I know, that is the only reference and in some ways it's problematic because when you look at sort of shorter accounts, this is the basis for what we know about Emedy and it's taken as concrete, whereas I don't think that's necessarily so certain. Thank you. And um, also, uh, is there another 
sorry, I'm just trying to. Um, is there any more information on the descendants, uh, perhaps? Yeah, there's. A, I think he has eight or nine children. Um, you know, some of them are known. So I think in terms of creating a family tree uh, for him, uh, and in terms of you know the surname within Cornwall, uh, uh, I think that is relatively easy to trace. Um, the difficult aspect is perhaps well, how does he fit within the society of Lisbon in the 1790s? What's the what types of documentation? might we have for him there? Um, how much can we run with this name, which is a Portuguese name, it may have been the name of his master. In the context of Brazil, it might have been the name of a godparent if he was baptized in Brazil. There's some reference to him receiving a Jesuit education in Brazil. Um, that would be quite unique, and I haven't really found evidence to back that up too much. I'm sensing a, a lovely research trip after lockdown has lifted. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing too. And then uh, if you can get students who may also want to go to, to, to Portugal or Brazil, then uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure lots will be keen. <laughs> um, Leslie has said uh, she's come across someone from Mylan near Falmouth who was involved in the slave trade investing in voyages out of Bristol. That's very interesting. And um, also Linda has asked, uh, what about the reminiscences of Camborn uh, by, is that William Tuck um, or W.M. Tuck, where he refers to Emily as an African Negro? That's probably okay. an aspect of that. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I wasn't uh, you know, um, familiar with that source. Um, and it's sort of what, what's interesting is the, the networks in which people lived and what they can collectively say about where people were born. Um, we know, for example, in the case of Alauda Equiano, uh, there's some debate uh, because he says he was born in what's now Nigeria. Uh, he has a baptismal record that says he was born in South Carolina. Um, but people who knew him in London within his lifetime knew him as Equiano the African. And if you were not born there, this would have likely come out. So perhaps there are other references that I'm not aware of, of people who interacted uh, with Emedy within his own lifetime. I hope I can save this chat and this will uh, appear in, in the recording as well um, because there are leads that I'll follow up on. Um, and yeah, uh, and so, Sorry. Oh no, I was going to say, um, I'll just make sure that I um, place all of your references as well um, when I put this recording up on YouTube. So any extra information you want to place uh, in that comment, yeah. uh, Richard, you can do. Um, I'm aware yeah. we only have a couple of minutes left. So yeah, I, um, I didn't answer uh, the other question. Yeah. Um, until, um, so really uh, in this talk, I focus primarily on um, the African presence um, in Cornwall rather than Cornwall's participation in slave trade uh, and slavery in the Americas, which is of course a related topic. Uh, there's much to go off of. Um, so slaving voyages aren't outfitted here, but there's a range of evidence. Of course, you know, Cornwall has many namesakes in places like Jamaica. There's a Cornwall County, there's a Falmouth, um, and there's a lot of evidence for uh, Cornish slave ownership in the Americas. So there's a database based at University College on legacies of British slave ownership that looks at the fact that at abolition, slave owners were compensated um, for the number of slaves they held in the Americas. And so we have claims for several thousand people from Cornwall. Uh, interestingly for this project, the Reverend George Kemp of Penryn uh, claimed compensation for two enslaved Africans that his wife owned in Barbados. So these are some records that students may wish to follow up on, looking at, well, the plantation ownership uh, in, uh, of, among Cornish people in the Americas. Uh, and I'm actually looking at a mine in the interior of Brazil uh, that uh, a Cornish company owned in the 19th century, that is after uh, British abolitionism, which had a large slave labor force uh, actually a lot of consternation from Brazilians who saw this as a sign of, of British hypocrisy. 
but these are some documents that are available at Crescent Curnow when they reopen. Lovely, thank you so much, Richard. This has been such an interesting and fascinating talk. Um, I'm sorry I can't answer everybody's questions. However, mm -hmm. what we will do, um, as soon as I've placed the recording up on our YouTube channel, you can find it just by typing into YouTube, uh, Cornish Maritime Churches. Um, once I've placed that on there, perhaps if anyone has any questions they would like to place in the comments, um, and I'll, I'll reach out to Richard, Richard and see if we can have them answered for you. Um, this has been such a brilliant and successful session, so I'm so pleased we didn't have many technical glitches. Um, so lovely, thank you ever so much everybody for turning up, have a great day. And just to remind you, tomorrow we do have another really fascinating talk, which is very relevant to what you've been discussing um, with your conversations at Crescent Kerno, discussing how graveyards and cemeteries can provide and reveal themselves as really um, relevant sources for uncovering maritime narratives. So please do join us tomorrow um, and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye.